drafting. It's one of the features of cycling that makes it so interesting and fascinating tactically. By sitting behind other riders and sheltering in their slipstream, you can save a lot of energy. You can ride at the same speed as them, but for less effort. And it's most noticeable at high speed. It's why we see riders performing through and off, taking turns on the front. It's why we see sprinters bursting out from behind their lead out trains at the last possible moment and it's why in the team pursuit we see riders constantly rotating round and sheltering in the wheels. But what about when you're climbing? I mean when you're climbing you're typically riding at a lower speed so is drafting still important then? Or is there a cutoff when drafting ceases to become important because you're not going sufficiently fast? Well we're hopefully going to answer that question by first listening to what a world-class climber and Tour de France rider has to say, talking to a world-class cycling aerodynamicist and expert, and getting Hank to ride up a hill as a sort of practical experiment. First up, we're going to hear from Team Sunweb rider Nico Roche. When it comes to riding bikes as fast as you can humanly go up mountains, Nico's one of the best in the world. He's a two-time stage winner of the Vuelta Espana and has also come 12th overall in the Tour de France. He's ridden for several teams over the years, but notably, he rode for Team Sky. And I say that's notable because Team Sky, you know, now Ineos, have been famous for having a lead-out train of domestiques behind which sits the team leader when they're going up mountains. So here is what Nico had to say while riding on his home roads near Monaco. So just going up the back side of the Madone, uh, gonna talk to you a little bit about drafting. So uh, how important is drafting on a climb? Well, it really depends on what type of climb. Obviously, uh, the steeper the climb is and the lower the speed is, the less important uh, the drag counts. So on those kind of flattish, fast climbs, obviously, uh, depending on the wind as well, drafting is more, a lot more important than some of the really, really steeper climbs. Does drafting impact, uh, just say, the uh, tactics of a race? Well, it definitely does. Um, you know, it's very often you hear, especially like on the Ventoux, for example, which is probably one of the biggest examples, where uh, it's very renowned to have this strong wind. So if you have a headwind on the Ventoux, or the same goes a little bit with the Lotte Ray, those climbs it's very important not to isolate yourself so it's all about tactics of knowing if you need to kind of fight to stay with a group or on the opposite if you're feeling strong it's like wait for the right moment because you know the group will have a, a severe advantage on you um, especially if there's a headwind with those uh, kind of flatter or, or more exposed bits and why does Froomey always stay behind his teammates? Well, uh, once again, uh, there's also a psychological side showing that all your teammates are there, that you're outnumbering most of the other teams. But also, obviously, from the uh, performance side, you are dictating the, uh, the speed of the race, uh, the speed you want, the speed you feel comfortable with, and making the most of having that draft. And like I said, then, uh, when his last man goes, usually uh, shortly after that, it's his time to, uh, to kind of make the difference. So it's basically to impose uh, his tactics or the team tactics on the race. And uh, like I said, also for the aerodynamics or drafting uh, advantage by using every single unit he's got in front of him. We're now gonna look at the maths and physics of drafting while climbing by talking to an expert. We're gonna to chat to Dr. Xavier Disley from AeroCoach, who routinely mathematically models climbs to help elite riders go up them as fast as possible. He has a detailed understanding of the aerodynamics of cycling, and using this combined with mathematical modeling, he's been able to help riders win the National Hill Climb Championships in the UK, notably Hayley Simmons last year taking the women's title, and Richard Bussell, who came second in the men's competition. Good to see you, Zav. Thanks for doing the call. So can you quantify how important drafting is 
when you're climbing? Yeah, so there's obviously a number of things that are gonna affect how important drafting is when you're climbing. So the amount of, um, uh, it, obviously everyone knows that drafting reduces your aerodynamic drag, right? Um, you, you can see this, you sit behind another rider and you know that your power output will decrease for the same, uh, for the same speed. Um, but the, the amount of uh, reduction in aerodynamic drag that you'll see will differ depending on a number of different factors. How big the rider is in front of you, how close you are to them, um, things like the wind as well. So if you're traveling at um, a slower speed and there's a very big crosswind, you don't get as much of that draft zone behind the rider as you would do if you're traveling really quickly and there wasn't, you know, wasn't a lot of wind. The rider who's who's got someone drafting them, their aerodynamic drag drops by about three and a half percent on average. So if you want to help speed someone up, sit on their wheel. <laughs> Obviously, not nearly as much as if you're on the flat and the importance of it will depend on how fast you're going up a climb. As a rule of thumb, is there a is there a sort of speed that you would, because this makes it easy for people to follow if they don't have a power meter or whatever, like is there a yeah. speed where you'd say, right now you're going fast enough that you want to be actually thinking about trying to draft, and right now you're going slow enough that you shouldn't care, just get up the hill. <laughs> so even if you're going down at like 15 kilometers an hour, it does make a difference a bit, but I'd say that um, just over 20 kilometers an hour is, is worth it. Um, mm. Certainly for extended climbs. If it's just like a one minute, two minute climb, it's not gonna make that much difference. Okay, so using your model, let's do a, a yeah. theoretical example. Um, so if we, if we say for the sake of argument, pick one of my favorite climbs, one we've, we've spoken about before, Sakalo in Mallorca, how much time, you know, could, could I save through drafting up Sakalobra? If I drafted the entire way behind another rider, um, yeah. if we say that the, the system mass of me is 76 kilograms with me and the bike and the kit, and then the power I would do would be 330 watts. We have to make a few assumptions with that. So uh, 330 watts, 76 kilos. Um, we'll set your aerodynamic drag at 0.35 meters squared, which is kind of like ballpark Normally, if you're, if you're on the hoods, then somewhere between 0.3 and 0.4 um, is pretty standard. So we'll set it at that. Um, and if we reduce your aerodynamic drag by 30%, like we just said, then that would see, uh, well, there are two ways of looking at it. It would either save you about eight and a half watts, or it would save you somewhere in the region of three seconds. Well, last time I did it, I did it, it my, my thing is 30.57 based uh, roughly on those 20s. numbers yeah. yeah so and i was i was a little bit heavier than i am now so oh, i've got to go back now unfortunately because of lockdown we can't go to mallorca but we found the longest climb near to where we are that that we have which is called the w it's out of nailsworth it's quite well known it's 2.57 kilometers long average of six percent and i'm going to send hank to ride up it so can you do a, a sort of model prediction of what you think he will do at a set power drafting and what he will do at a set power not drafting? Because that's what we're going to try and do in the experiment. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, he's already got the KOM on this climb. Um, <laughs> so we're going to, uh, well, I'll do a few different scenarios depending on how hard he's going to pedal. So if we assume he pedals as hard as the KOM, the important thing with this particular climb is that the first half of it is very steep. So it's about 9% for around 1,300 meters and then it flattens off a lot, so about 1.6%. And the speed in the second half is, is far, far higher than the first half. It's um, uh, basically nearly double um, what you get. So when he did his KOM effort, he averaged about 21 kilometers an hour for the first half and 40 kilometers an hour for the second half. Um, if we take that 30% drag reduction and we, uh, we give him that for the first half, then it reduces his power output required to travel at that speed, about 21 kilo hours, 20.7, um, by around kind of 12 watts or so. So not apps, not loads, um, and in terms of time, it would save him about five seconds in the first half. The second half is really interesting. So if we reduce his aerodynamic drag by 30% in the second half, when he's traveling a much, much higher speed, it reduces his power required to travel at that speed, 40 kilometers now, by about 90 watts. So he goes from needing somewhere in the region of like 480 watts to, to do 40k an hour at, you know, 1.6%. 
um, to 390, which is absolutely loads. So yeah, I mean, really, really interesting. What, what, I, what I suspect will happen is that um, the first half will be kind of similar, I think, because, you know, that kind of margin, kind of 10 watts or so, uh, will depend a bit on, you know, how well you're taking the corners, gearing, that kind of stuff. But the second half is where you're going to see the big, the big improvements. So if Hank goes out and does it at 300 watts now, um, I'd imagine that, yeah, it was somewhere in the region of 10 to 20 seconds is what I'd, is what I'd expect. But again, it depends a lot on um, conditions. See how the wind is, uh, what the wind's doing on that flatter section at the top. Because if it's a really big headwind, I think you'll see big improvements. It might be, you might even get that 10 to 20 seconds just on that part. Um, and a couple of, you know, a handful of seconds on the, on the steeper bit. Thanks for your time, Zav. Always a, always a pleasure. And yeah, good luck helping athletes in the uh, National Hill Climb this year. Hopefully it goes ahead. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, uh, yeah, Rich Bustle can take the win this year as well. Your... I, know he's, I know he's keen, for sure. He's certainly getting his training in. <laughs> On to our practical experiment then. Hank is going to ride up the W three times. He's first going to ride at a target speed of about 320 watts with no drafting assistance whatsoever and we'll see what time he does. This is our baseline. He's next going to ride up the climb behind a draft in the form of his dad on a motorbike. Good day's filming today. Good little side of camera set up. And he's going to aim to hold the same power that he did without a draft and therefore, in theory, he should be quicker while drafting, but we'll see what happens and see how much quicker he is. He's then gonna ride up a third time and in this instance, he's gonna try and match the time and the speed that he did while drafting behind his dad and we'll see what the power difference is because in theory, again, he should have to put out much more power without the benefit of drafting, particularly if Zav's correct on that top flatter section. Now, the interesting thing about this specific climb is it's pretty steep at the bottom, but then plateaus at the top, but it gives an average gradient of 6%, and it's about the most alpine climb I can find in the Cotswolds. So it's got a few switchbacks in there too. I'm going full Skytrain. I've got my Pinarello F12, a bit like the Skytrain, and I'm also gonna use a motorbike for drafting because I think that's a little like how Kirienka would act like. Yeah, a motorbike. Right, I better stop procrastinating and uh, get on with these sessions. That's effort one complete. I felt quite good. I was still quite, uh, what, fresh. I averaged about 320 watts, but we'll wait and see what the time is. Now to go and do the second time up. This time I'm being drafted using my dad's motorbike as my peloton. Yeah, it was easier to get him to do the session than to get a big sky train, as you can probably imagine. Right, round two. Still picking up speed. And my watts going down. That's test two complete. I tried to sit on around nine to 11 miles an hour at the bottom when it was nice and steep. And then as it plateaued, came onto the top where we had much more of a headwind and I could see my watches just plummet and I just stayed at constant pace, even rising the speed to around 22 mile an hour. So I guess, in my heart of hearts, it's gonna be, well, a big win for the drafting. But I've got one more set to do. I better go and do it. Right, quick disclaimer. The route I did, or the Strava KOM that I was trying to go for, is slightly longer than the section I set myself, and that was because it got a little bit of traffic towards that junction, so I had to cut it a little bit short, down to 2.24 kilometers instead of the full length of the segment. But luckily enough, I've still got that KOM. So I'm gonna go into the results now. The first run I did wasn't drafted. So that was sitting at the 300 watts that Ollie gave me to try and sit at. And I was gonna do the whole run, so the 2.26 kilometers without drafting. So I did that in six minutes and 39 seconds with an average wattage 
of 321 watts. So that's pretty close to the 300 watts that Ollie set me. And my average speed was 20.4 kilometers per hour. The next run I did was drafted, but it's trying to stay at that 300 watts. So I did it in a time of six minutes and 20 seconds. So shaving 19 seconds off my previous run. I averaged less watts, so I averaged 315 watts. And my speed was 21.3 kilometers per hour. So that's a whole kilometers per hour faster across the whole climb. The run three wasn't gonna be drafted, but that was gonna sit at the 21.3 kilometers per hour that I set in the previous run. So I did it in a time of six minutes and 32 seconds, so 12 seconds slower. I averaged 339 watts. So it's quite a lot of watts more than my previous ones. And I'd sat at a speed of 20.8 kilometers per hour. So I think you can tell then from the data that drafting well, makes it a hell of a lot easier. Right, Ollie, I guess, mate, it's uh, back to you. I get to get out of this kit. Thanks for that, Hank. Uh, what's well, pretty amazing for me when I look at the results is that the modeling is, well, quite surprisingly, pretty consistent with what Hank actually did. So. This is especially the case when we break the climb into the two halves, like Zav suggested. The steeper first half of the climb, Hank averaged 320 watts and went 16.1 kilometers an hour when he was drafting behind his dad. And then on the second half of the climb, he only had to average 242 watts to travel 34 kilometers an hour. You know, it shows that the drafting makes a significant difference as soon as you start going that little bit faster. Now, when he's trying to ride at the same speed as the draft, but without the draft, the difference is stark. So he's still getting a benefit on the first half of the climb, the steeper bit, as he had to average without a draft 343 watts, you know, 20 watts more to try and nearly match his speed. And he was still slightly slower, 15.4 uh, versus 16.1 kilometers an hour. But on the second half, it really starts to show. So he did 324 watts. He must have got a bit tired after the first half of the climb. Um, and he averaged 32.6 kilometers an hour versus, you know, 242 watts going 34 kilometers an hour drafting. That's pretty consistent with Zav's prediction. He also said he had a slight headwind, which would have exacerbated it a bit. But that's 80 watts roughly difference, which is Blumming massive. I guess in conclusion uh, from this, you know, drafting is significant, even if you're going at speeds of around 15 kilometers an hour on steep climbs. And as Nico says, there's also a massive psychological benefit to be gained by holding the wheel and having that pacemaker, even on bits where drafting isn't as important and you're going slower. If you're chasing seconds, then this is something well worth considering. But if you are going slower and you're not putting out those big power numbers, numbers and you're going around 10 kilometers an hour, you don't need to be worrying too much about drafting. That said, if you are riding on a slower bit of a climb, but coming up further down the road is a sort of flatter, faster section in that climb, it's probably worth trying to hold the wheel just so that you get the massive benefits that you can get on the flatter, faster sections. But if you're going up a really steep climb or you're going to be averaging less than 10 kilometers an hour, like me on the Angleroo where I was just clinging on for dear life, then <laughs> you don't need to be really concerned about drafting. If you're anything like me, you'll just be concerned with trying to get up and not die. I hope you've enjoyed this video and found it informative. And if you have, then please share it with your friends and give it a like. And let us know in the comments and on social media what your thoughts are on drafting on climbs and what your experiences of it are as well. And if you'd like to support the channel and what we do, then why not head over to shop.global cycling network. We've got all manner of goodies over there, t-shirts, mugs, and all, all well, loads, loads more. Also, um, in case you're wondering where my t-shirt begins and my milky white arms uh, end, um, I, I can't tell either. I've been inside so long, I just need to go out and get some colour. I'm, I'm a Casper the Friendly Ghost. It's ridiculous. Just want to say a massive thank you to my crew. Yeah, I've brought the dad and the sitter to do some filming today. Absolutely epic. And yeah, it was a good day. I mean, it's sweaty and it's hot and it's nice, but uh, I mean, couldn't be better with family. <laughs>